Abraham, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you are watching Israeli News Live. The message today, the, the news, breaking news that we are bringing today is Pope Francis is actually identified the Antichrist. That's exactly right. It may sound kind of absurd to say that. Uh, we'll be covering other uh, news stories as well uh, with, a, with a, an agreement that's being made between uh, Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Also, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the IDF and the rocket launcher that was destroyed in northern Gaza here just recently. And of course, uh, there's issues going on in and around Ukraine that are constantly up on the... Uh, just getting out of control, needless to say. Let me first take you, though, about... Pope Francis identifying the Antichrist. Now, this is a prophetic segment of the news. I have to make sure that we bring this out here when I say this because this is a very unusual title. And I have to say, unbeknownst to himself, he has identified the Antichrist himself. Not only has Pope Francis, Francis identified the Antichrist, but in, in the past, every pontiff has actually identified the Antichrist. This is something that was very interesting, something that we caught recently as we were, were looking at some of the Greek part of the scriptures where John is speaking about the Antichrist that shall come. Now keep in mind, we know that there are many Antichrists. John says that there were many Antichrists in the past, but he clearly identified when he first begins to speak about this in the book of 1 John, that he speaks about that the Antichrist shall come. It is a singular man. We have pointed this out before in the, in the biblical teaching side, the New Institute of Biblical Research, about how that, that the prince that shall come in Daniel 9, uh, verse 26, uh, clearly identifies the same, one and the same, the Antichrist figure as well. But the Antichrist and how Pope Francis has identified the Antichrist is actually seen in the very word itself. Antichrist, as you see in the King James Version and many other, NIV, the American Standard, all the versions that have the word Antichrist, is actually a transliteration of the word Antichristo. And this word, a Latin word that was transliterated into the English language, does not define the word. It does not actually, it is not a translation of Antichrist. It is only a transliteration. In other words, just like, for example, if you were to say a Roman in Hebrew, for example, we may transliterate the word, spelling it uh, resh vav mim uh, yod nun, perhaps, a Roman. Okay, that would be only a transliteration. We would use letters that are very similar to those of the, uh, uh, that, would, that would make out the sound of, of the word. And most people know what a transliteration is, but just so that I can make this more plain for viewers that may not quite understand what I'm speaking about. So when we say the word antichristo from the Latin word, it was transliterated into English as antichrist. But in English, the word anti is someone or something that is against something else. So you would think this is something that is against Christ. Well, in one way, that would be a nice way to put it. But it's only a transliteration. It's not the real thing. So what is antichristo? What is the word anti in the Greek language? According to strong concordance, it is a substitute or someone that is in place of. The correct way to translate this word anti is using the word vicar, a vicar of Christ, or a vicarious, the word vicarious. The very word would be the only way to truly translate this correctly, because that's what a vicar is. A vicar, another, of course, another Latin term, is the same thing as anti. It is something that is in place of. It is a substitute. What many people say, vicarious filia dilia, instead of the Son of God, the Latin terminology. It's the same word as anti in the Greek language. And so every pope that has ever come along for the Roman Catholic Church takes on the title of the Vicar of Christ or the Antichristo. It's one in the same. It is a substitute or one that is taking the place of. It is a similitude. 
And if you look these words up in strong concordance, you will find this out, that this is exactly the same meaning. So the popes themselves have identified themselves publicly right before your eyes to be the Antichrist. It's kind of interesting to say the least. Quite, as I said, very much unbeknownst to Pope Francis that he's actually identified himself as the Antichrist. Now, something else I wanted to share with you, and, and many of you may already be aware of this, the very word vicarious filii, filii dii, the Latin term, this is actually something that is on the triple crown of the Pope, but you can find it in Rome. And of course, the Vatican has no problem whatsoever in accepting this title. They believe that the Pope of Rome is God on earth. It's in their own statements. It's in their own, the former popes in the past have clearly said that he is God on earth. He takes the place of Christ. That's why they call him a vicar or an anti, as the Greek word would say, one that is in place of or instead of, actually is the way Strong's brings it out. Okay, vicarious philae dei, which is right there in Vatican, the Roman city there, uh, this is the title that is given to the Pope. If you take the numeric value of this title, the V in Vicar being a equal to 5, the I equal to 1, the C equals to 100, the A and the R have no value. I equals 1. Also, at the end of this particular broadcast, take a look at the chart, a uh, very interesting chart that you'll see there that will give you even more proofs. In the Latin language, both U, the letter U, and the letter V are synonymous, one and the same, representative of the, of the number five. And then, of course, S has no value, because remember, it's written over the Pope Vicarious, which that's equals to 112. Remember, the scripture says it is the number of a man. Also, the philae, which is F-I-L-I-I -I in Latin, F having no value, again, one, or the I being equals to one, the, uh, the L is equal to 50, and two more I's to follow, both equaling to one each, which is the number 53 in total value. Then we get to the last uh, part of it, DI. See, uh, DEI, D equaling 500 in the numeric value of the Latin letters. E has no value, and again, I, uh, I is equaling to one. Add these numbers up, 501 plus 53 and 112, you'll get 666. Those of you that catch the, the YouTube here, uh, or catch our Israeli News Live on YouTube, you will actually get to see this chart there. We haven't quite got to the technicality on, on live stream here to be able to post that. That is coming in the very near future. And the time frame right now, running at 10 p.m. on live stream, will continue while we're in the U.S. We'll be picking a new time frame when we go over uh, back to uh, Europe and over into Israel. Uh, something that will work for, for places all around the world to be able to view. Now, I want to bring one other important thing out, though, that I thought was very interesting as well. Again, identifying the Pope of Rome as the Antichristo, the Antichrist, the one that is in place of the Messiah, and that is the word in Hebrew. We have a word that uh, you can say the Roman, or a Roman man, Romiti, and it's spelled Resh Vav Mem Yud Tav Yod. Excuse me, Yod Tav Yod. Yod. This here literally means Roman man, and it's how you were to you were to write it out in in the Hebrew language. And again, another interesting point because remember. According to, to Daniel's prophecy, the prince that shall come shall be of the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary of Jerusalem. In 70 AD, it was Titus the Roman general. And what is the Roman general? He's a Roman man. And of course, he would, the prince that shall come is going to be of this particular people. And that's correct. We clearly see this. So in the future, from the time of 70 AD, which we're now 2,000 years later, we would have a Roman Antichristo, a Roman Antichrist, or a prince that shall come. And of course, notice again, there again, it's a prince. And right before that, in verse, uh, in, in just before that, in verse 26, we find out that, what does Daniel identify? That the, uh, the anointed prince, the Mashiach, the Messiah, would be cut off, but not for himself. That's the true prince. But then he speaks of this other prince that shall come. He's never called the Mashiach, the other prince that comes, which clearly, again, identifies a anti, an antichristo, 
one that would take the place of the Mashiach, one that would be like the Messiah. Well, kind of interesting, if you call him a Roman man, as Titus was, he was a Roman man in Hebrew, again, this has a numeric value in Hebrew. The Resh having the numeric value of 200, the I is a 6, the Im is a 40, the, uh, the Yod is a 10, Tav is 400, and again, the Yod is a 10. I'm not getting into Kabbalah or nothing like that. I'm not saying what it means. I'm just showing you because every number in Hebrew actually has a numeric value, just like Latin does and in many other languages. Because at one time in the Bible, of course, well, it still is in, in, in the uh, Tanakh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible, we use letters for the numbers of the chapters and verses. That's the way the Bible is laid out. So this is not Kabbalah. We're not saying what they mean or represent, just showing the letter having a numeric value. If you add these up, again, it adds up to 666. Remember, according to the Barith Chadashah, the New Testament, the Christian Bible, it says that it will be the number of a man, and his number is 600, 3 score, and 6, or 666. So the Roman man it adds up to 666 as well. What's even more interesting, though, the word Roman man is also translated as another Hebrew word in modern Hebrew, and it means betrayed. And it's exactly the truth. It's been a Roman man, Pope Francis and all the other popes that have betrayed the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. Well, judgment will soon come, and God will set the stage straight the way it should be. Let's continue on in other news uh, quickly here, going to Tehran Times. Uh, we're following the little story here uh, where it says Iran, Syria, and Iraq will form an alliance against terror. They're dealing with what they call terror. And, of course, a lot of times when they call terror, they're speaking of the Israelis. But let's, uh, we know that they're also combating ISIS. And uh, we mentioned many times before on Israeli News Live, ISIS is something that the United States help fund and back secretly. They have not come out to admit that, but it was created in Jordan. So it's kind of interesting. You don't see Jordan very much involved in this. Of course, they have been involved in camp bombing campaigns just to make it look good, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, it says here that Tehran Ali Akbar Vayati, a senior advisor to the leader of the Islamic Revolution, says Iran, Syria, and Iraq will form an alliance against terrorism in the future. Talking to reporters on the sidelines of his meeting with Syrian Interior Minister uh, Mohammed al-Sahar uh, on Tuesday, Velayati said Iran, Iraq, and Syria can defeat terrorism through cooperation. It's kind of interesting how they're joining together. And of course, if we see Syria, Iran, and Iraq join forces, it only spells trouble for Israel in the not-so-distant future. Since the first circle of the resistance of the campaign against terrorism has been formed by Iran, Iraq, and Syria, and we are certain that with the unity of the three countries, we can win over terrorism in the future. A close relationship will take shape among the three countries. Veliati said Syria and Iraq are fighting terrorism on the behalf of all countries in the region since terrorism has no borders. Uh, again, uh, it sounds like a nice thing, but uh, what's going to shape up? Who knows? It seems like, though, that Iran is definitely leading uh, the, the region, in, uh, or that, this part of the world, they've also been trying to take over Yemen with the Houthis, and, uh, and of course Saudi Arabia has kind of been a thorn in their side there, uh, but if Iran takes over this region of the world, it will certainly spell disaster, uh, no doubt, for Israel, but there again, we are fully uh, in believing that, uh, that God himself, uh, Yahshua, the, uh, the Mashiach will actually intervene for Israel on their behalf because it will take that, especially with the rest of the world turning against Israel, uh, the European Union, the United States, NATO, everyone has turned against Israel. So it is definitely going to take the coming of the Messiah, uh, which we believe is the second time he's coming in order to intervene on Israel's behalf. Uh, also, the IDF... Uh, destroyed the rocket launcher used to attack Israel earlier this week. Uh, those of you that are aware of it, that, uh, the, that Gaza had launched rockets into Israel. Uh, so the IDF air, uh, aircraft struck a rocket launcher in northern Gaza shortly after midnight on Tuesday, uh, said an IDF spokesman. The launcher that was, uh, that was attacked is the same one which was used in the rocket attack on the Haf Ashkelon region earlier on Tuesday evening. The IDF statement said that Israel considers the Hamas terrorist group responsible for any rocket attacks from Gaza. The IDF confirmed that the rocket launch 
from Gaza was identified. Reports indicate that the secession of explosions was heard. Uh, and uh, just before 10.30 p.m., rocket was found in the Hof Eshkelon region, having fallen in an open area and caused no damage. Thank God for this. Responding to the rocket attack, Yisrael uh, Bittner, uh, Chairman Evigador uh, Lieberman said that Israel cannot put, put up with tricking of rocket fire. Those who are willing to abs uh, absorb uh, trickling will eventually receive a torrential rain. We must not accept this situation, he says, warned M.K. Lieberman, adding a government that is ready to accept the situation less than a year after the military operation in which we paid a high price in the lives of soldiers and the disruption of life in the entire country for two months has no right to exist. Um, anyway, uh, also we are, we are seeing a lot of uh, interesting things happening in and around Ukraine. And uh, the President Poroshenko, who is the uh, current president of the Ukrainian people there, uh, has stated here recently, and this is reported on TASS News Agency, um, that um, um, he has ruled out the country's federalization and threatened the leaders of the self-proclaimed uh, Donetsk uh, and Luhansk republics that the Kiev authorities would prosecute them under Ukrainian legislation. No federalization will be permitted, he said, at a meeting in the National Reform Council. The initiators of creating any republics will be brought to justice should anyone try. The response will be instantaneous. No, we should have the temptation to create any republics in Donetsk, Luhansk, and uh, Bess Bessarabia. He argued, the issue of national defense security public ordered external relations and issues and keep the vertical chain of command uh, int integral will regard as an exclusive competence of state power, he went on to say. Now, the problem here is that, one, he's not honoring the Minsk agreements that were worked out uh, between uh, NATO powers and Russia. Uh, Germany, uh, ch uh, Chancellor, um, excuse me, uh, Merkel, who was involved in this, along with other uh, world powers there, and this crisis in Ukraine is definitely boiling up at, a, at an alarming rate. Uh, we do know, and we say we know this, uh, mainly because there is enough evidence on both sides, both Russian troops have been in eastern Ukraine, as well as U.S. troops, special forces uh, for western part of Ukraine. Now, neither side is admitting to this, but you can tell by the escalation of the events that are taking place, the types of armaments that are being used on both sides, uh, as well as a number of other private reports that have been done, that this is the case. Also, uh, recently we see that uh, the United States said that they were, uh, President Barack Obama was sending in more heavy artillery and warplanes into the region. He basically is not scaling back on anything as a result, as he says, according to that President Vladimir Putin had, uh, uh, was bringing in 40 plus more intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now, as we have reported in the past, and again, we, we hold this still to be true, uh, this is a, just another propaganda report by the White House. Uh, of course, and I say that not being one side or the other, Russia's just as bad about bringing propaganda to their own people, but we know for a fact we have eyewitnesses on the ground. We were in Europe when they were already bringing in the heavy artillery. They've already had the um, American warplanes in the former Soviet uh, uh, Soviet Union. There, the states that were that were under Russian control uh, during the Soviet years. This has been reported to us from Lithuania, from Poland. Uh, the only state basically that has not had this is the Czech Republic. Although after the war games. The troops did come through there. We were actually there. We filmed it, but we have seen the trains where they're taking the heavy armaments into the eastern part of Europe there, preparing for some type of large-scale military confrontation. It is about to spiral out of control. And if the way that Poroshenko is going, it is obvious that he knows he has the backing of NATO. Uh, but quite frankly, I do not believe that, uh, that Germany nor France really wanted to see this thing escalate the way it has. And neither has Putin, but undoubtedly the US is determined to bring this to a war. And perhaps that's the only thing that might save the US economy. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Shalom.